You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 2nd, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, chronic cough in adults. Our presenter is Dr. Alan Gold Sobel. He's an adjunct clinical associate professor at Stanford University Medical Center in Palo Alto, California. Well, thanks very much, Jay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for inviting me back again. And uh, we're going to talk about this interesting problem that I've been interested in now for a number of years. There's uh, 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 committees at the uh, academy and college that are interested in chronic cough. So if anybody listening, listening uh, is interested in this subject, uh, you're welcome to contact me or the uh, college at the academy. There's always good programming at the college every year uh, about patients with chronic cough in both children and adults. Um, uh, the educational objectives for this morning, I'm going to mainly concentrate on adults. We can certainly have some questions about kids. There are some differences in the approach to chronic cough in children and adults. So Jay, you'll have to invite me back again and do uh, chronic cough in kids sometimes. So we're going to understand and describe these, the common causes of chronic cough and some issues about management and practical ways, hopefully somewhat cost-effective ways to manage the cough and, and, and look at some of the the tests that are done to uh, to look at this problem. Cough, as you know, is a is a normal protective mechanism, uh, a reflex that is uh, present in all mammals, necessary for effective airway clearance of secretions and aspirated material, uh, and it's a common symptom of respiratory disease. So therein lies the problem that many patients uh, have a cough. Uh, that that may in fact even be normal, and yet they're worried that it's a, a symptom of respiratory or some other type of disease. Uh, Richard Irwin, a pulmonologist at the University of Massachusetts, has uh, uh, put forth the uh, concept that to understand the causes of cough, you have to understand where the cough receptors are located. And this is a schematic drawing uh, showing, uh, I think you can see my uh, mouse arrow showing the locations of the uh, where the black circles are uh, of cough receptors. VN stands for vagal nerve. Cough receptors are all uh, part of are, are all mediated through afferents uh, of the vagal nerve. And as you see here, cough receptors are located in the larynx, not in the pharynx. If you stick a tongue blade in somebody's uh, mouth, you can get them to gag, but uh, for the most part, you don't get them to cough, but certainly if you tickle their larynx, you can get them to cough. Uh, they're located down into the trachea and in the large airways, mainly at the bifurcations of the large airways, and, and they're not really, they're not located in the more peripheral airways. Um, in about 3% of people, there's a, uh, uh, a branch, an aberrant branch of the vagus nerve that goes into the external ear canal. And you can once in your career make the great diagnosis when the kid comes in coughing and you, no one can figure out why. And you look in the ear and there's some foreign body in the ear and you pull that out and the coughing goes away. Again, only 3% of the people have that. Um, this shows cough receptors on what's supposed to be the pericardium and down into the GI tract. This is an older article and, uh, it, it, and, and obviously there's a lot of issues regarding regarding cough in the GI tract. Uh, I think that they don't believe now that there are uh, certainly not any number of cough receptors on the pericardium or directly in the GI tract, and we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, this uh, bullet point there, uh, uh, or target, shows uh, the location in the brain stem uh, where the cough center is located uh, in the nucleus tractus solitarius, and that's uh, Again, the the, uh, the cough center, and from there the afferents go to there, and then and then the cortex has a cortical input as well. You can see on this uh, again uh, cartoon that um, the red, and again this shows alveoli. This is an older an older uh, uh, slide that uh, for the most part cough receptors are in the in the larynx and the trachea and the larger airways and these afferent vagal pathways 
come back to the brain stem. Cortical influence uh, basically means that I can, uh, my, my uh, higher functioning cortex can tell my brain stem <coughs> to cough. Um, and, and that is what's involved, for example, in patients who have habit cough. It's, it's primarily coming, uh, the, the start, if you will, is basically coming from the, uh, from the cortex. And then the efferent pathways are, are back um, um, uh, to the diaphragm, the abdominal musculature, the intercostal muscles, uh, which cause cough. Uh, again, uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that uh, pathway is called the cough reflex. And, you, and in this schematic, you see, again, an airway and these, the putative cough receptor, which uh, is um, in, in large part thought to be due to uh, receptors that are part of the uh, TRIP family. This is uh, TRIP V1, which has stimuli both mechanical, thermal, chemical, and inflammatory uh, that then, through the vagal afferent, sends the signal back to the brain stem and then back out to the respiratory muscles. Um, uh, again, these are the types of stimuli that will, that will cause uh, the cough receptor to be uh, activated. And there's active research in, in, uh, in drug trials uh, or in pharmaceutical companies looking to find uh, a non-narcotic way of blocking uh, the cough receptor. Uh, this, this uh, cough reflex uh, can be measured. It's measured mainly just in, in uh, research trials. It's not been found to be clinically useful, but by, by breathing in a tuss tussogenic agent such as capsaicin, the, the uh, chemical of hot, that's in hot peppers or chilies, uh, can stimulate the cough receptor. Um, and, and so there's a concept of both increased cough reflex sensitivity and decreased cough reflex sensitivity. Again, a number of stimuli through these neural mediators, and, and a number of these are involved in, in allergic reactions which stimulate cough. Um, and, um, and so there's the concept that we're going to talk more about, about cough reflex, increased cough reflex sensitivity or cough reflex hypersensitivity. Um, uh, one, one thought was that, well, maybe patients with, who are prone to have extra coughing uh, just have more of these uh, uh, TRIP V1 receptors. And these are, this is a, a study looking at uh, uh, um, electron micrographs of these TRIP V1 receptors uh, in, in the airways of patients who have chronic cough. Uh, and you can see that there was... Uh, uh, a highly significant difference between in the number of, of the expression of these receptors in patients, these are adults who presented with chronic cough versus those with healthy control. The, the picture, and I, don't complete, and I certainly don't understand the picture completely, but it is definitely much more complicated than just an increased number of, of cough receptors, and yet that does seem to be one part of the picture in these uh, uh, adult patients who who are having a, a chronic cough. Um, I think it's important for anybody seeing these patients, and, and in particularly allergists who see so many patients with asthma, to understand that there's a difference uh, between cough reflex sensitivity, that reflex, and airway hyperreactivity, that reflex. They are independent physiological responses, but they can coexist. You can see patients who have increased cough reflex sensitivity and those who have increased uh, airway hyperreactivity. Uh, and, uh, but, but again, they are, are separate phenomenon. And I, I use that in the clinic all the time when I'm seeing somebody with asthma and they're, they're just having a chronic cough. And I'm thinking, well, is this all just a manifestation of increased airway hyperreactivity? Or is it, in fact, from cough reflex sensitivity? And again, there's, there's uh, not a, a practical clinical way of measuring cough reflex sensitivity like there is airway hyperactivity. You can show that, that different medications will block one and not the other. Inhaled corticosteroids will, will uh, diminish airway hyperactivity, but not cough reflex sensitivity. And again, in that, same, in that same vein, medicines that affect bronchoconstriction, albuterol, atropine, chromalin, will reduce airway hyperactivity, not they do have no effect in cough reflex sensitivity. If you give a patient um, a capsaicin and measure the number of coughs they have, 
these medicines will not block that. And medicines that will block cough reflex sensitivity or uh, the cough reflex lidocaine or oral codeine have no effect on bronchoconstriction or airway hyperactivity. So I think it is, again, important to, to think about those two, those two functions. And, and so now you're, you, you see more uh, um, reviews like this or, or, or um, um, graphs like this or, or where this is from a review from uh, Wardlaw and Ian Pavord in England. Just, this is just was a, a review article on airway diseases. And, and they show, you know, there's a number of different factors that go on here. And they show, again, the, the, the scale from e, being eosinophilic to neutrophilic. Uh, and again, they show, uh, you know, there's airway hyperresponsiveness and there's cough reflex hypersensitivity. I know certainly when I was a fellow years ago, I don't think anyone ever, I don't think the words cough reflex hypersensitivity ever were, were in fact mentioned. Um, and the, the same group in a different article, again, when they look at, at the concept of airway diseases in these Venn diagrams, you see the, the usual overlap between asthma and COPD, uh, and then you know, viral-induced wheeze, uh, the small, uh, which is probably you know, the, the large number of, of, uh, of, of children who get viral-induced wheezing. There's also uh, infective or, or viral-induced asthma, particularly ABPA has a, uh, a small uh, little Venn diagram there, bronchiectasis in adults. And then there's this you know, fairly large diagram there for patients who have chronic cough as, as being uh, often an airway disease. Now, we'll, I'll explain this more, but this is talking about the person who has chronic cough uh, and, and they may have underlying asthma, they may not have underlying asthma, but as a, as a separate condition, if you will, they have this increased cough reflex hypersensitivity. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at cough frequency in different diseases, this has been measured. Um, and there's newer ways, uh, and a group in England who, who uh, has done a lot of research on how to accurately measure uh, uh, cough uh, frequency. And, and so you can see in terms of coughs per day, healthy people maybe cough uh, uh, 10 or 12 times a day. Children certainly cough more. It's the, up, the study's shown up to 37 times a day in a normal child. Uh, patients with asthma do have a higher cough frequency, not as high as in COPD or interstitial lung disease, or in patients who have acute cough, usually that's um, um, uh, you know a viral and uh, an acute viral upper respiratory tract infection, uh, but the highest number of, of cough epochs, as they call them, coughs per day, are in patients who have again adult patients who have this this condition of chronic cough. Now, how do we how do we define that? Uh, and it, this is from the ACCP guidelines, the American College of Chest Physicians published guidelines on on cough in 2006, and um, allergists were not very involved in those guidelines. They're redoing the guidelines, and it is from the, the, the College of Chess Physicians, but, but allergists have been much more involved since then in terms of, um, the, uh, uh, in terms of patients with chronic cough, although not a lot of, of basic science research necessarily coming from allergists. But, but in adults, uh, acute cough is defined as up to three weeks. There's a category of subacute cough, which is three to eight weeks. And then chronic cough in adults is defined as cough that has been present for greater than eight weeks. The importance of that is that prior to that time, it's not suggested that one would initiate a, a, an evaluation or a workup for patients with, with for adults with chronic cough uh, because uh, basically, a, a viral infection, which is the most common cause of acute cough and the most common cause of subacute cough, can the cough from a viral infection can last up to eight weeks, maybe other than or, or from a respiratory tract infection, uh, viral or bacterial, is said to last up to eight weeks, except for possibly pertussis, which certainly could last longer than eight weeks. Um, in children, and children are defined in these guidelines as being under 14 years of age, uh, acute cough is, 
is said to be up to four weeks, and chronic cough is greater than is defined as greater than four weeks. But but most people um, would would use the same eight weeks in children as well uh, before uh, really being concerned about it or initiating some kind of a uh, a separate evaluation, if you will, specifically for the cough. Now, now subacute cough is is most often this concept of post-viral or post-infectious cough. And I, I, you know, we, we as allergists, we, you know, versus pediatricians who see um, a lot more kids with just acute viral respiratory tract infections. But, but, but I see a number of patients, as I'm sure you do as well, uh, kids. Uh, or, or adults, but more kids who the mom brings the child in because he's been coughing for a week or two, and she wants to know why often he has underlying asthma, and it's important to to uh, determine if this is manif if this is a manifestation of of worsening asthma control. But um, but I find myself often realizing, oh my gosh, this is probably just a a, a normal post viral cough and. And um, which which parents don't like to hear that often, but but it's a common cause of just non-specific cough. It's more common in children than adults. It's a dry cough for the most part, not a not a wet mucusy cough. Although it certainly can be in kids a wet cough. Uh, it's due to increased cough reflex sensitivity. The viral infection has heightened that that cough reflex. Uh, and it can, by definition, as I said, last up to eight weeks. This is not cough variant asthma. Again, it does not respond well to a beta agonist. And there's, it responds to inhaled steroids only if there's associated increased airway hyperactivity. Uh, but patients may have associated shortness of breath, wheezing, reversible airflow obstruction, and even a positive methacholine challenge, because viruses can also induce transient uh, increased airway hyperactivity. This was shown by Homer Boucher in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. So it can be somewhat complicated that that viruses can both in induce increased airway hyperactivity and increased cough reflex sensitivity. Um, and then even to make things more complicated, viruses and post-viral cough can also make GERD worse or, again, bring out airway hyperactivity. So there, there can be uh, interaction, if you will, but this concept of post-viral cough, especially in somebody who does not have underlying asthma or airway hyperactivity, is just important, again, to remember clinically when you're seeing somebody coughing for three or four weeks, just to, you know, again, make sure that nothing else is going on and yet, um, uh, and, and yet be aware that, that normal coughs can last up to eight weeks. I, I say that, and yet I would say, and I'm sure all the allergists listening would say that um, in, 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 with, with saying that and, and with the, um, the uh, great pressure that is on all physicians these days not to overuse antibiotics, it, it, I, I think, and I think many people recognize that, that many, pa many atopic patients um, and, and allergic rhinitis patients who do get a viral infection, then a persistent cough, uh, they do certainly seem to have a, a higher incidence of developing uh, sinusitis. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm not saying that I would wait for somebody uh, to uh, uh, cough for eight weeks before I would consider treating them for sinusitis. Uh, but, but, but this is in general talking about just the, the, the general public, if you will. Um, the, wh what is the cause of chronic cough uh, in adults? Uh, Richard Irwin, as I mentioned, the pulmonologist from the um, University of Massachusetts, has been a, uh, done studies on this for 20 to, to 30 years, uh, uh, looking at um, patients, adults who present to his pulmonary clinic uh, with chronic cough and what is found to be the etiology. And this has been kind of the, the gospel and how you would answer a board question for, for a long time. They found that what they called initially post-nasal drip syndrome, now called upper airway cough syndrome, was present in 41% of the patients. This is the, all of these studies have been fairly small. They usually have maybe 100 patients is all. 
asthma was the, found to be ultimately the cause in 24 percent, and GERD in 21 percent. Those three, the big three, uh, are caused the uh, majority of the, or the majority of the causes you see in, in his study, 86 percent were caused by one or multiple of those three, but bronchiectasis in adults, COPD. Now, now again, this is in a, a, a uh, somewhat um, um, special population, if you will. Uh, these are just patients that were referred into him consecutively, so uh, most probably pulmonologists in the community would uh, intercept patients who had chronic bronchitis and COPD uh, and not refer them in to his clinic. So um, uh, not saying that, that COPD is not a, a larger cause of chronic cough, but when, when the patient who presents to the clinic that no one's been able to figure out what the cause of their chronic cough is, and then in a, in a smaller percentage is not listed there, we're still post-infectious cough, but again, a very small percentage, greater than eight weeks. The other important point he makes that I'll make again is that, that uh, in about 25%, of the cases, he finds that there's multiple causes, usually uh, one, two, or three of these causes uh, in, in conjunction, and you can't just treat one. You have to treat uh, two or three together to be successful in the elimination. And, and in, in the 90s, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, he was famous, if you will, for stating that he could find the diagnosis of patients with chronic cough, adults with chronic cough, in 99% of the cases, and, and that's not thought to be, uh, that, that's not been replicated by other, by other centers. Um, Castellic is, a, is an article from England where there's also a, a, uh, a, a, a large interest in patients with a chronic cough. This was published a little bit more uh, recently in 2005. Um, again, a fairly small number of patients. Um, and, and they find in their study that only about 6% of patients had this upper airway cough syndrome. There have been a number of articles written about this uh, transatlantic difference, why in America it seems that, that patients have upper airway causes, and yet in England and, uh, they, they seem to not, not recognize the concept of this upper airway cough syndrome. And I'm going to define that more in just a second. Asthma was about the same percentage. GERD was about the same percentage. Uh, and all the rest were about the same. But again, it, because of that lower post-nasal drip syndrome, they only found the big three were present in about half of the patients, multiple causes in, in, a, in a smaller number. And, and they found about 7% in which they were not able through their, their algorithm to, to figure out uh, what the cause of the chronic cough was. In more contemporary studies, it, it's now thought that up to 40% of patients uh, presenting with chronic cough do not seem to have, adults who present with chronic cough, do not seem to have uh, any of these, any of the big three as the underlying diagnosis or other common causes. And again, the evaluations that are done we'll talk about in a second. And so there's this that that's this, this concept now of, of chronic idiopathic cough, or what they now call chronic cough hypersensitivity syndrome, uh, that, that in some studies is, is up to 40% of patients presenting, again, usually to cough clinics now or, or pulmonary clinics um, uh, or, or to a pulmonary allergy clinic at the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, uh, about 40% of the time, there's no uh, straightforward underlying diagnosis. But these big three, we're going to talk about in just a second, asthma or asthma syndromes, uh, the rhinosinusitis, which is upper airway cough syndrome, or gastroesophageal reflux. Um, asthma, first, uh, is this, in, in Richard Irwin's studies, usually found to be the second most common cause of adults with chronic cough, uh, about a quarter of the percent, about 25 percent. It's probably due to inflammatory stimulation of the sensory afferent vagal nerves that are involved in the cough reflex from, um, from um, uh, neuropeptides and other, uh, and, and other things that are uh, found in the airway of asthmatics. 
the coughing can be associated with wheezing. It can be associated with reversible airflow obstruction. Uh, it can be associated with a positive uh, methacholine or mannitol challenge, uh, all part of the asthma process, and uh, with a high nitric oxide. And, and that often, is, I'll show in a second, is, is used as the now as a uh, easy way of, of trying to see if a patient with chronic cough may have uh, asthmatic airway disease. But, but now it's thought that, that, that there are these three components that consist of, if you will, the asthma syndrome uh, under this auspices of, or under the concept of chronic cough. Classical asthma, cough variant asthma, which we'll talk about, and this uh, entity of non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, or NAEB. And that's a, 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 a clinical entity that I, for a number of years, wasn't that familiar with. And now that I'm thinking about it more, you definitely can see adults who have a chronic cough, and often you think they have asthma, but in fact they have this NAEB. Um, uh, asthma versus cough variant asthma. Um, uh, for in, in about the um, um, 1980s, the lead author was Correo. There was an article first published in the New England Journal showing that there are patients who may have a, a different variant of asthma, that they tend to not wheeze or have minimal wheeze, and they have cough as their predominant symptom. And, and what's the, the, the difference? I mean, from, from an inflammatory marker uh, viewpoint, they're the same. They have sputum eosinophils. They both have ECP measured. They both have increased exhaled nitric oxide. They both have increased subepithelial basement membrane thickening. Um, asthmatic patients may have a normal cough reflex sensitivity. In patients with cough variant asthma, they clearly have a a much more heightened cough reflex sensitivity than a classical or typical asthmatic patient. Airway hyperactivity is present in both, but it often is not quite as strong, if you will, and when measured objectively in patients with cough variant asthma versus typical or classical asthma. And there's this concept put forth of wheezing threshold, and it may just be that patients with cough variant asthma have a higher wheezing threshold um, uh, than, than patients with typical asthma, but again, um, uh, they, they have um, similar inflammatory processes. Uh, this concept of non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis is a patient, this has just been described for the most part in adults, again, who have chronic cough, they have sputum eosinophilia, or the corollary of that, they would have a high exhaled nitric oxide but they do not have reversible airflow obstruction. They have a normal methacholine responsiveness, but they do respond to inhaled steroids. The presence of eosinophils kind of tells you that they're going to respond to inhaled steroids, so they're likely misdiagnosed as asthma or cough variant asthma. But if you're seeing an adult who's coughing and you've done an exhaled nitric oxide and you put them on, and it's time you put them on inhaled steroids and they get better, you know, that's really what we want to achieve. But, but uh, over time, I've seen these patients, and I realize, you know, I don't think this person really has asthma. The difference is that they, they don't do well, and they don't need a lot of treatment with bronchodilators, but they do certainly respond to inhaled steroids. Uh, again, these two, these two entities, uh, again, the difference is just the airway hyper-responsiveness that, that you can obviously measure. This last bullet point that says the natural history is unclear, that, that some of these patients do seem to, at a later point over years, develop into asthma. They can even develop remodeling and, and, a, uh, and even you know, more of a COPD-like picture as we see in some asthmatics. Here's another chart and dia diagram looking at these three entities, eosinophilic bronchitis, classical asthma, and cough variant asthma. And the point of this slide, again, we've talked about their their, their uh, similarities and differences, and again, eosinophilic bronchitis does not respond to a bronchodilator. The, the, there is one pathophysiological difference between this eosinophilic bronchitis and classical asthma and cough variant asthma, and this I can see 
maybe sometimes being a, a, a board question, uh, that, that there are no mast cells within the airway smooth bundles. You know, there is now recognized in asthma increased number of mast cells in the smooth muscle uh, of, uh, of uh, asthmatics and, and of cough variant asthmatics. They're similar uh, in the pathophysiology, but you do not see the increased mast cells within the airway smooth bundles. And, and so that then kind of working backwards it has been thought to be a, a, a large component of what contributes to airway hyper-responsiveness, mast cells in the smooth muscles that's not present in these patients with eosinophilic bronchitis. And as I said, you can use the ENO to predict an inhaled steroid response to chronic cough. JD, or, or if Jay's left, do you guys have ENO in the clinic there yes. that you're able to use? Yeah, we have a couple of machines, actually. So I don't know if, if you have found or the fellows have found that to be very helpful clinically, but, but, but certainly an exhaled nitric oxide level, this is a study from Kaiser Lim at the Mayo Clinic. Kaiser is both a board-certified pulmonologist and board-certified allergist, and he's done a, a number of studies and research in chronic cough, and he showed that in patients, again, presenting to his clinic with chronic cough, adults, if their ENO is greater than 35, Here's their sensitivity, specificity, pretty good, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and it was uh, maybe even um, a little bit better with a higher likelihood ratio if they used a cutoff of 38 uh, parts per billion. And a methicoline challenge has always been said to be the, um, the, the gold standard, if you will, that to be used and, and uh, in, in the patient with chronic cough of doing a methicoline uh, to see if they have underlying asthma. But I think many people have now uh, gone over to just using a, a, an ENO uh, as, a, as an initial decision, obviously, to see if they have, if they're going to respond to inhaled corticosteroids. Um, this, the, 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 the second of the big three, but in most of the studies in the United States, what's found to be the number one cause of chronic cough in adults is this called upper airway cough syndrome, the old name post-nasal drip syndrome. This is from stimulation of the afferent limb of the cough reflex in the upper respiratory tract. But, but remember, there are, no, there are no cough receptors in the nose or in the pharynx. If you're doing uh, rhinoscopy or rhinolaryngoscopy on patients, uh, for the most part, stimulating the nose and the um, pharynx does not cause cough. Um, but, but the theory is that there's maybe secretions that are dripping down into the laryngeal area or, uh, or a reflex, such as what's thought to be present in GERD. Um, and basically, any cause of rhinitis has been associated with upper airway cough syndrome, uh, and including all of those that are shown on that slide. Um, uh, it's often a clinical diagnosis. Um, post nasal drainage, nasal discharge, throat clearing, and, and it's been shown, and as, as you know, when you, over the years when you see a number of patients, historical reports of post nasal drainage or pharyngeal symptoms is often highly unreliable uh, to uh, verify that, in fact, that's present. There's no objective test or quantifiable test or direct proof to say that the that the rhinitic disease is the cause of the cough, uh, as in many cases here, it's the response to therapy that allows you to kind of retrospectively go back and say, well, that seems to be the cause of the cough. And again, it's thought to be due to cough receptors in the larynx stimulated by post-nasal drainage versus an upper airway reflex versus even the concept of the United Airways. Is it somehow is the inflammatory process in the, in the upper airway stimulating uh, cough receptors uh, in, the, in the lungs, in the, in, the, in the large airways, similar to the way that it's thought to also stimulate uh, an asthmatic response. Uh, and again, it's similar as we will talk about in GERD, in about 20% of the patients, they say, look, my, I, I, they come in with a chronic cough, they say, look, I, I don't have any post nasal drainage. I don't have any nasal disease that I can tell, and, and, and yet it's silent, and you do ultimately find that there is this 
this, con this upper airway disease and, and treatment of that relieves the cough. Uh, uh, and, and again, the diagnosis is usually made by, by response to therapy. Allergies certainly have been aware for a number of years of the, the both child and adult who, who have uh, uh, some low-grade or uh, persistent chronic sinusitis that, that's not clinically obvious and yet um, either with empiric treatment or with getting a, a, a CT scan and diagnosing that and treating that, uh, you can, um, uh, you can um, resolve and that would be you know, called, if you will, uh, a, a, a upper airway cough syndrome. So the first thing you would do is obviously treat the specific cause if you can, but, but, in, but again, in this up to now 40% of adults who are presenting to clinics around the, 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 the United States who, after treatment of upper airway disease, after treatment of asthma, after treatment for GERD, they still seem to have cough. Um, uh, sometimes they talk about just trying empiric therapy. And there's a, a study showing that using the combination of a first-generation antihistamine, maybe with a decongestant, plus nasal corticosteroids, plus nasal ipratropium, plus nasal antihistamines, I find good luck getting you know, a patient to take all of that, that, that they find that they can sometimes uh, get uh, improvement in this chronic cough when there is no obvious, and this is not just a straightforward patient with allergic rhinitis. Um, this is just my allergist's point here that, that, that I make when I talk on this is that uh, a, number of the pa a number of the doctors who, who, who talk on upper airway or talk on about cough and upper airway cough syndrome who are usually pulmonologists have done and Richard Irwin has said that, well, the, the newer generation non-sedating antihistamines are ineffective for treating cough due to upper airway cough syndrome. And, and, and um, that's because they've shown that first generation antihistamines, they, they used dexbromfeniramine in this, in, this, um, in this example, will effectively block a cough reflex uh, mechanism. It will block that cough reflex if you give somebody capsaicin that there is a, that, you know, in addition to having anticholinergic and anti-serotonergic effects of these first generation antihistamines, they do seem to block cough reflex sensitivity. And he's also done studies showing that uh, Allegra or Claritin or Fexofenidine or Ritidine do not, in fact, um, block cough reflex sensitivity. But, but, but certainly, um, and usually this isn't looked at, but these are older trials. This is a 1997 trial. Usually in simple allergic rhinitis trials, they don't even, cough is not one of the parameters measured. But I, you can find a couple of them. Here's a very small study, 20 patients and kids. They were, this was just an early cetirizine study for allergic rhinitis. But they happened to look at cough as one of the, 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 the symptoms in these patients who did not have asthma, they just had seasonal allergic rhinitis. And in fact, you saw over a simple four-week study of, of these patients, both with cough frequency and in cough intensity, cough frequency did not, well, it wasn't statistically significant. The blue is the patients treated with cetirizine, the white is the placebo, and you can see that there's a highly significant difference between intensity and cough frequency. So whenever I'm speaking to uh, pulmonologists, um, I always show these slides saying that, well, what do you mean for second generation antihistamines don't help with the upper airway cough syndrome? They're really talking about, about the patient who doesn't even have allergic rhinitis. They just have this chronic cough. And there was even one study I found that with, with mometazone furoate nasal spray, they happened to look at cough in addition to rhinorrhea, congestion, nasal itching. Again, 90 Eight percent of the nasal steroid studies didn't look at cough as an outcome. This is a study from Sandy Gotchik in the Annals of Allergy, and in fact, daytime cough was statistically significantly different. And again, a very short two-week trial of Nasonex. Interestingly, nighttime cough wasn't, and daytime cough responded better to Nasonex than rhinorrhea did. Um, so, so certainly, in an allergic rhinitis patient who has possibly in a hyper, hyperactive cough reflex, you certainly do see uh, decreased cough reflex 
uh, certainly you see a response to treatment with second generation antihistamines. Uh, here's the uh, lower esophageal sphincter and, and liquid and gas going back up. So this is the talk about GERD and chronic cough. Uh, this, is a, this is probably the biggest question area, uh, uh, both in, in um, I think, in the literature and in clinical research, as well as in the clinic. I find it most difficult to separate out, in my mind and clinically, both in kids, but even particularly more so in adults, in the chronic cough patient, if they have underlying GERD or LOT, in the prospective studies, these, you know, usually 100 patient studies, as I said, it's been found to be somewhere 20 to 40 percent higher usually in the English studies and the European studies than the American studies. You know, it's been estimated that up to 75 percent of the time, uh, uh, GERD causing cough can be silent. The GERD, um, uh, cough uh, as a complication of GERD would be considered one of the extra esophageal manifestations. And in some studies, they thought that there are some clinical clues, although other people have, have questioned this. Cough on phonation in this one particular study was associated with being responsive to GERD therapy. Cough upon rising, not necessarily cough through the night. Uh, there's more GERD occurring during the day than at nighttime. Throat clearing, coughing with eating, all those can be associated with eating in particular can be associated with transient opening of the lower esophageal sphincter. But I can tell you that there are more recent studies from 2006 who find all of these, these clinical parameters, cough with talking, cough with, associated with throat clearing, as being present in these patients who didn't respond to GERD therapy and had this chronic idiopathic cough. Uh, initially, in the Irwin studies, they would use a, a pH probe and they found a 89% a positive predictive value and a 99% negative predictive value that, that those patients would respond to PPI therapy based on the, res, the, the results of their pH probe. Um, but more recently now, I don't know in, in 1990 if the concept of non-esophageal or non-erosive reflux disease was even uh, understood. And now, it's been shown that at least in a third of the episodes, they are non-acid events. And remember, PPI therapy will only, only helps with acid disease, and, and non-acid reflux disease does not respond to PPI therapy. And I'll show you more about that in just a second. The, the initial treatment is just a, 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 a course of PPI therapy according to these guidelines. And again, the, 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 the cause of cough uh, from GERD is similar to the thought of what, what can worsen asthma from GERD. There's either an esophagobronchial reflex, which is thought to be probably the more likely mechanism, versus gross or microaspiration from reflux. And again, now, as I said, non-acid reflux and esophageal dysmotility are being increasingly recognized as being greatly complicating the picture. And, and again, I think this is always an important point to remember that the non-esophageal, I'm sorry, the, the extraesophageal manifestations of GERD, be it cough or, or uh, asthma, which also has its controversies of association with GERD, uh, will take a lot longer and require more intense therapy than the, the acid symptoms. So patients after two weeks of, GERD, of PPI therapy say, well, I no longer have any acid indigestion. And I'm still coughing, so obviously that is not the, 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 the cause. And, and it, it takes a lot longer period of time, two to three months sometimes, to, to resolve the cough. Um, one of the uh, major differences between the 1990 studies and the more recent study has been the, the ability to do uh, impedance studies. And I'm certainly no, imp no expert on impedance or impedance pH studies together where they measure, as they show, different, different this, this schematic is the esophagus into the stomach, and they show um, sensors at different levels, both above the, the upper esophageal sphincter and then uh, relation to the lower esophageal sphincter. And, and on this impedance scale, that can measure differences between air, 
the mucosa itself, differences between Barrett's mucosa and normal mucosa, water or saliva or, or, or stomach refluxate. And so it can measure basically anything that passes by the esophagus based on this impedance scale. And, and they get these studies that show these different traces that show that here's a normal swallow that is, as time goes on, the bolus uh, of impedance changing goes down. That's a normal swallow. And in reflux on impedance, you can see the direction of this bolus was upward. Uh, and it may or may not be at, it may or may not be acidic, but they can measure refluxate, if you will, coming up the esophagus. And so there have been a number of studies now using both impedance and pH probe trying to associate um, um, GERD and cough. And this was a one study from 2005 where they found that basically saying that, well, which, uh, is there a two-minute window in which cough and reflux both occur? Reflux measured by impedance, acidic or non-acidic, and cough measured in, in a, by a, a separate mechanism. And in 70% of the patients, this is a very small study, but in 70%, the cough and the reflux events did not, did not occur within a two-minute window of each other, so they thought they were not likely to be related. In 15%, the cough came first and then the reflux. And certainly we know with both asthma and with chronic cough, that can cause more reflux with increased abdominal pressure, and the cough was maybe the primary uh, event. And in 15%, in only 15% of the patients, the, the reflux seemed to be first within this two-minute window, and then the cough occurred secondarily. And of the reflux episodes, 65% were acidic, 29% were weakly acidic, and 6% were non-acidic. And a more recent study from this group in England that is expert in in understanding how to measure cough, they found that, again, using a two-minute window association, that in about half of, the, half of the patients, there was no cough reflux association. And in about you know, 15%, 15%, 70% overlap, uh, there was uh, acid reflux associated with cough. And then in almost equal numbers, non-acid, 15%, 15%, similar to the other study. And it, but in 70%, again, in relatively small numbers, they had both evidence of both episodes of non-acid and acid-inducing cough. So it, it's a very complicated picture now that, that, that I certainly don't understand. And you know, use the uh, help of a gastroenterologist. The, the classic therapy is said to be PPI therapy twice daily, plus 30 minutes before meals, ranitidine at HS. And as you know, it's important to also talk about lifestyle measures with patients for a good, effective trial. Are there medical treatments for non-esophageal reflux disease? Not, not great ones. Uh, and again, I, I certainly use my GI colleagues to, to help with that. But these medications have been used. Cisapride, you know, is really not used any longer because of possible side effects. Uh, some patients do seem to respond to metoclopramide to increase gastric emptying um, or baclofen, which will decrease these transient lower esophageal uh, uh, um, uh, relaxation events. But, but it, the, the treatment of non-esophageal reflux disease is different. Let me just talk about a couple other things here. Don't forget about ACE inhibitors. Uh, it's thought to that, that the range, depending on the agent, is anywhere from 5 to 35 percent uh, of the time treated with an ACE inhibitor. They will develop a cough. It can vary by the, which ACE inhibitor is used. And, and I certainly, every once in a while, see a, often an elderly uh, adult uh, man or woman who's been coughing and they're referred over and they're not sure why. And it's, no one thought that it's because they're on an ACE inhibitor. This is from these guidelines, and I think this is a good slide to go back and look at that shows that the, unlike the angioedema, the time to onset of ACE-induced cough peaks by eight, you know, well, almost five to six weeks, and certainly by eight to nine weeks. If they haven't developed cough by that time, they're probably not going to. 
And it's also important to remember that time to resolution of the cough can take, usually it's within a couple of weeks, but it can take up to four to five weeks. And if you stop the ACE inhibitor and they're still coughing at four, five, six weeks, then that's probably not the cause of the cough. Uh, these are just showing that, that you know, if, if, if cessation is not an option, there are some medical therapies that have been tried, but in most patients you just get them off of the ACE inhibitor. And ARBs have not been associated with the same incidence. Some people will say possible, but for the most part, ARBs are not thought to cause it, so you can't switch them from an ACE to an ARB. i would mentioned, again, other causes in adults, you know, bronchiolitis, bronchiectasis. Uh, certainly, and I'll show you in a second, you're going to pick that up early on from, you know, chest x-rays. Lung cancer is what in adults people are always worried about in the patient with chronic cough. It's a very low incidence in, the, in these studies of patients presenting with chronic cough. It's been 1 to 2 percent max uh, foreign body, not as common in adults. These typically you would see more in children than in adults. There are some newer thoughts. There are obstructive sleep apnea and treatment of obstructive sleep apnea has now been shown to be a cause of chronic cough. I've seen one or two patients. I published with Pramod Kelkar a, a, a patient that in, the, in the Journal of Allergy in Clinical Immunology who had upper airway, who had obstructive sleep apnea, chronic cough, and treatment, and ultimately was it until we realized the, the treatment of that resolved the cough. There are patients described who have chronic tonsillar enlargement, not necessarily gross tonsillitis, but contribute to some sort of upper airway inflammatory process. That Arnold's reflex I mentioned in the ear, hypothyroidism. These are, you know, very low incidence causes, but if you're vitamin B12 deficiency, if you're really struggling to figure it out. So what's the basic step for evaluating? And I know I've got to stop in just a couple minutes here. If they're on an ACE inhibitor, stop that. If they're smoking, stop that, which is often difficult. Obviously, everybody on presentation of a chronic cough, for the most part, child or adult, will deserve chest x-ray and spirometry if they're old enough. And then act with that basic data, often what's done is you try to uh, formulate in your mind, well, I think it's this, or they may have reflux, or they they may have upper airway disease, and then try and treat that and see what their response is. And there's a number of algorithms like this. I'm not going to go through this completely. Again, this is from these the ACCP guidelines in CHEST in 2006 that, again, shows about uh, how you uh, approach this history, exam, chest x-ray, and then start maybe some empiric treatment. If you think they have asthma, put them on an inhaled steroid if no one's done that. If you can get an ENO, that will help a lot. And then if they don't respond to this basic treatment, then you might think about getting uh, more uh, invasive studies, 24-hour pH monitoring, uh, endoscopy, you know, high-res CT scan, et cetera. Uh, and again, that's a good thing to go through. Just a couple last things. Again, when to expect a response? Smoking cessation, the cough from smoking cessation can take up to four weeks to respond. Like I said, ACE discontinuation up to four weeks. Post-nasal drip syndrome is usually two to four weeks. Asthma, it's set up to six to eight weeks. Usually, if they have asthma as a cause of chronic cough and you put them on inhaled steroids, they get better in less than six to eight weeks. But it can take up to that long. GERD, as I said, can take up to two or three months. Eosinophilic bronchitis very responsive to inhaled steroids, and they could respond even sooner. So be sure and not to give up soon. Um, I'm going to stop there and just see if you have any questions, because I know David Kahn is coming up. There's a couple of other slides beyond this, if the fellows want to look at that. Just look at that concept of chronic cough hypersensitivity syndrome. Um, and there is, there, it's very difficult to treat that patient. They're, they're trying. It's thought to be this chronic cough hypersensitivity syndrome is thought to be some sort of a sensory neuropathy, maybe a post-viral neuropathy, 
like you know Bell's palsy is a motor neuropathy. There's, in some patients, there seems to be a laryngeal hypersensitivity that may be a post-viral uh, 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 sensory uh, uh, um, hypersensitivity or post-viral neuropathy. Uh, it also, some people find that these chronic cough hypersensitivity patients have a VCD-like picture that they can show with laryngeal studies. And in Australia, they respond as in like VCD patients do to uh, a modified form of speech therapy. So I've tried to f like find a good speech therapist there at the hospital. You guys probably have good speech therapists. Like for VCD patients, patients who have chronic cough can often respond to that sort of therapy. So you guys can look to those slides. And, and please, are there any questions uh, that, that uh, you may have? Thank you very much for that talk, Dr. Gosobel. Um, um, we're going to ask the audience if they have any questions. Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> um, I actually have a kind of a question clarification. When you were talking about using um, first-generation antihistamines for um, po chronic post-nasal drip to help resolve the cough, and you mentioned Zyrtec, um, isn't the reason that Zyrtec is different because it's, it's more like a first-generation antihistamine than a second? Because it's the derivative of Atarax, it has anticholinergic effects, and it's non, it's it's uh, still possibly sedating. Uh, you know, I I don't think that's thought to be the 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 difference. I've not seen the the the, the study. There 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 are studies that show that with fexofenadine, it does not it will not block that cough reflex. If you give patients fexofenadine, and then you have them. Uh, breathe in cat says and the, the the spice from hot peppers and elicit excuse me elicit coughing that will not be blocked if you give them chlorpheniramine or bromphenyramine or the most effective was dexbromphenyramine um, that will lessen the number of coughs uh, and and somehow directly suppress cough reflex sensitivity I I'm not sure I I mean I know that Zyrtec can be a little bit more uh, sedating, obviously, and it is a derivative of hydroxyzine. But I've, I've not seen. Is it your understanding that Zyrtec does have more, specifically, more anticholinergic uh, activity? I'm not sure if that's known, but it, it, that that may be. I would tell you that that certainly Zyrtec responds well. But the same study could have been done with Allegra. It's just treating the uh, the the allergic rhinitis. And that's the cause of the upper airway cough syndrome. When when they're saying that that second generation antihistamines don't work, they're really talking about not a patient with simple allergic rhinitis, but the patient who has some form of of upper airway inflammatory process that that beyond allergic rhinitis that doesn't respond to simple uh, antihist second generation antihistamines. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We're getting a little past time here. We probably should end. No uh, problem. So thank you very much. And um, I'd love to do it again. And uh, hope, uh, hope the mold spores come down soon. Thank you. I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure I'll be calling you or contacting you again about doing this. Um, and again, thank you for taking the time out of sure, your business. Paul. I will do this. No uh, problem. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.